May I present now to you the Honorable Calvin L. Rampton, Governor of Utah. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Meeting which he had recently attended, where the speaker brought to the dinner meeting his secretary and a typewriter and sat her beside him while she typed and he took the uh, pages of his script from the typewriter and read them to the audience. <laughs> now this uh, talk tonight hasn't been quite that hastily prepared. As a matter of fact, I outlined it uh, last weekend and began preparation on it on Monday morning. But this has been a particularly heavy week with legislative problems. And so when last night arrived, less than a fourth of it had been dictated, and actually it wasn't until five o'clock this afternoon that the last uh, pages came off my Now, it's a sincere pleasure for me to introduce Governor Rampton to you tonight. We think vocational educators will agree that he is known as the governor who has brought vocational education to the foreground in Utah. For this, we can be very grateful. His understanding of the vocational technical needs for Utah's economy is most apparent. We're doing things in vocational education in Utah, and our governor is leading the way. May I present now to you the Honorable Calvin L. Rampton, Governor of Utah. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Last evening, Mrs. Rampton and I attended a dinner at which one of our dinner companions told us of a meeting which he had recently attended where the speaker brought to the dinner meeting his secretary and a typewriter and sat her beside him while she typed and he took the pages of his script from the typewriter and read them to the audience. Now this uh, talk tonight hasn't been quite that hastily prepared. As a matter of fact, I outlined it uh, last weekend and began preparation on it on Monday morning. But this has been a particularly heavy week with legislative problems. And so when last night arrived, less than a fourth of it had been dictated, and actually it wasn't until five o'clock this afternoon that the last uh, pages came off my secretary's typewriter. By the way, my secretary, who has worked for me now for 24 and a half years, is a sister of your president-elect, Garland Pusey. I've never dared ask her which is the older of you, <laughs> Garland. <laughs> <laughs> But <laughs> at any rate, as uh, today was supposed to be a state holiday, and uh, Maisel, as Garland knows, is not one to suffer in silence. There have been many remarks made during the day about the disadvantages of working for the governor's office. But at any rate, I am delighted to be here tonight because this is one talk I very much wanted to give and probably would have sought the opportunity to deliver had I not been invited. John W. Gardner, the former Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare, and currently organizer of Common Cause, recently said, the society which scorns excellence in plumbing, because plumbing is a humble activity, and tolerates shoddiness and philosophy because it is an, an exalted activity 
will have neither good plumbing nor good philosophy. Neither its pipes nor its theories will hold water. The need for increased emphasis on vocational education, both in our public schools and in post-high school institutions, has long been recognized by critical analysts of our educational system. Only recently, however, has the recognition of this problem reached general public attention. And even now, many of our citizens, while giving lip service to the general concept of vocational education, do it with the assumption that this is something that someone else's children need, but not their child. In the state of Utah particularly, it has been difficult to focus adequate attention on act occupational educational needs. We've been proud in this state, and with good reason, for our achievements in academic training. We are now, and for many years past, have been among the top three states in the nation in the average number of years of schooling completed by our citizens, in the percentage of high school graduates among our population, and we're at the absolute top in the nation in terms of the percentage of our people who have secured baccalaureate degrees. Perhaps this obsession with academic training has to some extent made us myopic regarding the needs of our people for training in the occupational skills which find a ready market as quickly as the student finishes his training course. Our record in this regard is not all bad, however. During the last six years, for example, state appropriations for our technical colleges have cre increased from slightly over $900,000 a year to $2.5 million a year, an increase of more than two and a half times. But still, this $2.5 million is only 5% of the total state support for post-high school education. This in spite of the fact that more than three-fourths of the positions available in the labor market in the state of Utah require technical training rather than a baccalaureate degree or a postgraduate degree. This disproportionately low level of support for vocational education is not the fault of the administrators of our vocational system nor the legislature, which, is estab which establishes educational priorities. These people are reacting to public demand, and the public demand for additional enrollment capability is still heavier in the academically oriented institutions than in the technical institutions. The problem, therefore, confronting those who are deeply concerned with our lack of progress in technical education is to awaken the public awareness of available facilities to stimulate a demand among the public for vocational training opportunities and to change the attitude of the public which demean those who work with their hands and exalt those who work with their minds without regard to the excellence of the product of either group. The need for technical training exists not only among the so-called disadvantaged in our society, but with the financially affluent as well. A lack of interest in, or a lack of aptitude for academic training is not confined to any one group of our people. The colleges and universities in our state 
as well as in other states in our nation, include among their students many, many, many young people who are merely putting in time, whose objective is merely the social prestige of attendance at an academic institution and the degree that will come with it if they just stick it out. The fact that many of them do stick it out results not so much from the value they themselves put on their attendance as on the desire for social approval or family approval. The fact is that the family, which either through outright demands or by subtle pressure, pushes a young man or woman into the pursuit of a career for which he is not adapted or for which he has little interest, does a serious disservice to their sons or daughters. The social prestige that may come to a family from having the children of the family secure college degrees cannot compensate for the maladjustment in the child's life resulting from an attempt to put him into a mold which he just does not fit. Much better to have a happy, well-adjusted, and productive technician in the family than an unhappy, frustrated, mediocre doctor or lawyer. To paraphrase John Gardner, we must learn to value excellence in plumbing above shoddiness in philosophy. Less than my effort to emphasize the importance of vocational training, I appear to be understating the value of academics. Let me stress that I feel that an opportunity for a liberal arts education is highly important, even for those whose primary interest is in vocational and technical training. With the work week decreasing, and the amount of leisure time of our working people increasing, it is important that we have broad non-occupational interests which broaden our outlook and enrich our lives. We should, therefore, have in our post-high school vocational and technical institutions the availability of liberal arts subject on a very broad scale subject, however, to four safeguards. One, academic achievement in liberal arts subjects in high school should not be made a condition to entrance into a post-high school technical institution. Two, enrollment in liberal arts subjects should not be required of students in a technical school but should be purely on a voluntary basis. Three, the certificate or diploma issued on graduation from a technical school should in no way be enhanced or granted greater dignity based upon the completion of academic courses or upon the degree of achievement in academic courses. And four, the academic program in a technical college should be relegated to a secondary role. We're all aware of instances where post-high school institutions have tried to be both academic and technical institutions with equal emphasis on each. The classic pattern is that over a few years, the technical curriculum is reduced to a secondary position and the institution strives to become a four-year liberal arts college or university, somewhat ashamed of the vocational aspect which it tries to hide. I feel, therefore, that it would be a definite mistake to attempt to make our technical colleges into junior colleges with full liberal arts curriculum with degrees or certificates conferred upon the completion of academic courses. Not only would this endanger the t technical curriculum, but would, re <coughs> me. 
but would reduce the appeal of the institutions to many who are most in need of vocational education. With the interest in and the emphasis on vocational education escalating so rapidly, it is to be expected that many problems will arise as how best to structure the programs and how best to administer them. In a recent issue of Compact, publication of the Education Commission of the States, one of my fellow governors, Russell Peterson of Delaware, summarized some of the problems which are confronting him and his state as follows. Quote, can occupational training best be conducted at the high school level or in post-secondary technical institutions and junior or community colleges? What should be the relationship of these levels to each other and to proprietary schools, in-service industrial and business programs, and apprenticeship programs? Should efforts be job-oriented for immediate employment, or would students be better served by general training which anticipates the changes of a technological age? Can existing accreditation structures and organizations accommodate the growing complexities in this field? End of quote. These same questions need determination in Utah as well as elsewhere. One thing that has concerned me quite deeply is the struggle which appears to be developing over the control of voca the vocational educational program. The objective of all is the same, to structure and administer a program which will provide the maximum and training to the people who need it how or by whom vocational education is administered is of secondary importance. At the present time, the technical colleges are under the general jurisdiction of the Board of Higher Education, with the State Board of Education, which is ex officio, the State Board of Vocational Education, filling the role of institutional counsel. I have been aware of conflicting currents and tensions resulting from this arrangement. Shortly before the legislature met, I received a resolution from the Vocational Educational Association complaining quite bitterly about the role of the Board of Higher Education and recommending that the institutions be returned entirely to the control of the State Board of Vocational Education. More or less as a trial balloon to see what the reaction would be, I suggested to the legislature a restructuring of the State Board of Vocational Education. My proposal would have constituted a board with three members from the State Board of Education, three members from the State Board of Higher Education, and three members from the Manpower Training Council. The action was swift and vocal. Everybody was against it. I might say that uh, because of that, I've uh, rather abandoned the project, but uh, at least the proposal accomplished one thing. I achieved unanimity on one subject between the Board of Education and the Board of Higher Education. <laughs> However, <laughs> seriously, and I do mean seriously, the memorandum of understanding which has been arrived at between the state board and the higher board appears to me to be a basis for a satisfactory working relationship in regard to the governance of the technical colleges. It is inevitable, however, that there are going to arise questions not specifically covered by this memorandum. If both boards, however, 
have as their basic concern the excellence of the program and not jurisdictional rivalry, there are no problems which cannot be amicably settled in the interest of good administration. It may be that considerable uneasiness was created on both the part of the Board of Higher Education and the State Vocational Board by the creation of the Manpower Planning Council. This uncertainty I regret, and I attempted to alleviate it by assuring all concerned that there was no intention on my part or on the part of anyone in the executive branch of state government to create a third system of education. Assurance was given that as rapidly as possible, the skill center created by the board and the Manpower Planning Council itself would be absorbed into the established and recognized agencies of the state. The developments giving rise to the establishment of the Skill Center began a number of years ago as various agencies of the federal government seemed to be competing with each other in the establishment of so-called manpower training programs. As the term is generally used, a manpower program consists of three parts. One, identifying those who are trainable but who have no marketable skills and motivating them to secure training. Two, to provide for the training either in institutions established by the manpower training program or in already established institutions on a contractual basis. And three, upon the completion of training to secure employment for the trainee. Most of the manpower programs for which the federal government offered either full financial support or heavily weighted matching funds were aimed at the disadvantaged community. At the beginning of 1968, when we took inventory of the situation, it was discovered that we were receiving from the federal government 26 separate manpower training grants totaling in the neighborhood of $30 million a year. These grants came from various divisions within the Department of Labor, the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, and the Office of Economic Opportunity. Often there seemed to be a complete lack of planning and often a lack of knowledge on the part of one department or division of the government as to what was being done by another in the manpower training field. So far as our state government was concerned, we had responded to the opportunity to channel money into manpower training programs until we had almost as many programs as there were federal grants. Generally, the Department of State Government most closely associated with the federal government agency making the grant available would receive a particular federal funding and establish programs pursuant thereto. In order to bring some type of order out of this apparent chaos, the legislature in 1969 passed legislation providing for the Manpower Planning Council and giving it authority to seek a consolidation of the manpower grants and to coordinate within this state various manpower training programs. We approached the various federal government agencies and found them receptive to the idea of channeling all manpower grants through the Manpower Planning Council, which we have proceeded to do. This system has worked well enough that it is being closely observed by the federal agencies as a model program for other states. And I would say that I have been asked to come back on three occasions and testify before congressional committees 
as to how this consolidated program is working within the state of Utah. I mentioned a few minutes ago that the manpower programs were designed principally to aid the underprivileged. <coughs> In an attempt to put a consolidated program together, the Manpower Planning Council attempted to find capabilities in existing educational institutions to furnish the training necessary. And where this was possible, funds were channeled to the existing institutions, and they furnished the training services on a contractual basis. In some places, however, we found the need for particular types of training that were simply not immediately available in any of our established educational institutions. Because we are eager, uh, eager to deliver the type of training the programs were intended to support as evidence to the federal agencies that we were capable of consolidating and carrying on such a program, the Skills Center in Salt Lake was established for the purpose of filling in the gaps in enlisting curriculum. I'm sure that many of you have visited the Skills Center, which was established in the vacated part of the Old Troy Laundry Building, which still forms part of the campus of this institution. However, we have, through this program, wherever it was at all possible, channeled our students for whom we had a responsibility into the existing institution, and only where there was an incapability of meeting these particular problems which arose from some of those in the disadvantaged community who did not have spontaneously the initiative to achieve training, did we send them or did we refer them or did we encourage them to attend the skills center? The maximum number of people in training at any one time in the skills center has been approximately 300, while at the same time as high as 1,200 additional people in manpower training programs sponsored under this consolidative grant were being trained under contract with other educational institutions. I assured those in administrative positions in the vocational schools, including, I'm sure, Dr. Nelson and Dr. Talbot, that as quickly as possible, the Skills Center would be transferred to the jurisdiction of our established state agencies. Last November, the State Board of Education agreed to assume the jurisdiction of the Skills Center in Salt Lake with the stipulation that the actual operation of the program would be handled by the Utah Technical College in Salt Lake. This administrative change took place on January 1st, 1971. At the present time, it is proposed to establish a second Skills Center at Ogden under the jurisdiction of Weber College. I do not intend that these skill centers shall operate separate and apart from your institutions, and I would like to see them integrated as quickly as possible, but in integrating them, we cannot lose the capability for which the skill centers were specifically established, that of, in addition to furnishing the training to certain young people to establishing the incentive and the desire in those young people to take the training and to achieve the occupational skills that go with it. What will be the future of the Manpower Planning Council itself as separate and apart from the skill centers is uncertain. We're all aware of the proposals recently made by the president for the restructuring of the federal government and the changing of the concept of grants and aid to the states in favor of a revenue-sharing program. Until it can be determined what is done in this regard, it appears that our present arrangement 
will continue to work satisfactorily. When and if the method of channeling monies to the states by the federal government is changed, then without question, a substantial restructuring of state agencies may be required. In the meantime, however, we continue to have our joint problem of providing training and jobs to those who need them.